but it's me again, Gadget UK, and this time we're looking at uh, Commodore 64. Uh, so this is the C variation, uh, obviously, you can see how yellowed the keys are. I'm not sure whether I'm going to treat those or not. The idea with this one, um, and videos moving forward, is to try and repair things, and then uh, just sell them on. Um, often they'll have sold before uh, this video gets uploaded, so uh, yeah, you're wasting your time sending me messages saying, can I buy it? Um, you can see the key there is uh, wrong. <laughs> Someone said, it's, uh, I think he said it was uh, broken. The key is broken. Uh, I think he meant broken. Uh, it's not broken. Someone's just pulled it off and put it back on the wrong way, so uh, I can't get that. I'll do it with the lid off in a minute. It'll be easy to get my uh, fingers underneath it just to pull the cap off and connect it back up. Um, but this is described as uh, having some sort of loading faults. So I'm guessing uh, a couple of things could have happened. It could just be the C one of the CIAs has died. It could be that uh, someone has plugged the power into the serial because uh, I've seen that uh, before on these. I think the last one of these I looked at there was uh, had a loading fault. That, that's exactly what had happened. Someone had connected the power into there. Uh, I think I've heard of that before, where people can plug the uh, power into the serial. It looks like it would be a better fit for the video actually, but I, yeah, I think the pin alignment's slightly different there. But in any case, something like that might have happened. We might have some damage to the CIA via the you know something that's been stuck into the serial interface here. It could just be the diodes. Uh, I think it was on the other video, but I think I had to replace the CIA as well. Uh, the diodes had shorted, uh, you know, the clamping diodes there. So we'll connect this all up now. Um, I'll try it with the cart initially just to see if the system is working. And then we'll do some testing with the serial and tape just to make sure um, those are okay. So I've got power and composite connected. Um, we're getting basic of okay, correct number of bytes. Um, keyboard seems to be working, I think. Let me just press loads of different keys here. Yeah, I mean, I'm not testing every key here, but the columns and rows seem okay. We're not missing anything as far as I can see. Let's try shift, run, stop. Yeah, okay, so I'll try it with the carton. Are we gonna get sound? Yep. Bit loud actually. Yeah, that sounds good. So we'll connect up the SD to AEC next. So SD to AEC connected. Do you know it's that long since I've used uh, my CC4? I can't remember how to load. Yeah, okay, so let's see what's happening. Um, loading, run. Well, a disk would seem to work okay. I'm starting to wonder if there's anything actually wrong with the C64 to be honest. So let's try and load a bit of Rambo, see if that works. Yeah, it's decompressing now, so it looks like it's loading alright. That's working. So I've got the cassette deck connected there, rewound it, shift run stop and press play. Now I was going to jump straight in there and connect up the 1541 Ultima actually and use that as the tape uh, mechanism if you like. But then I decided against that. I've had so many, uh, well I've had a few bad decisions recently where I've just rushed in and done something. That's working. And thought uh, afterwards why did I not just go at a bit of a slower pace there and I could have averted the disaster. Good example is I destroyed one of my 
no, I squinted ultimates actually. Uh, just because I was lacking VCC, you'll see that in uh, an upcoming video. I was missing the VCC, that's all it was, missing 5 volts, and it died as a result of it. Um, so it must have been some sort of latch up fault. But you see, had I gone at a slower pace there, perhaps you thought a bit more logically, what I should have done is tested one of my disposable swinsets. So what I mean by that is there's tons of them available for around the £10 mark on eBay, maybe a bit more than that, maybe £12 or £13, including shipping. Uh, but those are a bit more um, spendable, you know, you could, it doesn't matter if too much if one dies, but the Swinson Ultimates are uh, limited, there's no more being produced. So, yeah, I'm a bit gutted about that. And I did a similar thing with that N64 um, save pack, you know, took the batteries and stuff out, didn't think too much about the uh, connectivity when I put the battery back in, making sure it was in there, right? And I killed that. So in this case, yeah, I wanted to just uh, air it on the side of caution kind of thing and just test an actual cassette deck rather than risk killing my uh, 1541 Ultimate. But as you can see, and here, that's working fine. So there's actually nothing wrong with the C64. It's really super annoying when I buy something faulty and there's actually nothing to do. Uh, it's just going to be a clean-up job, this. Uh, I mean, I'll clean it up anyway. We'll do a video on it because otherwise uh, it's going to be a bit thin on the videos uh, just at the moment I think. Well I may have found a fault, I'm not sure. Um, the F1 key, it's like the spring's missing, I think. So that would cause some problems. Oh hang on, it's back now. Yeah, did you hear that? Now it stopped again. Uh, it's back. So I think we've got a keyboard problem there. The spring I can easily replace, I think. So just testing with the uh, 1541 Ultimate here and my joystick. Um, yeah, it would appear to be just uh, keyboard problems, I think. That F1 key primarily being stuck down a lot of the time is uh, perhaps what's caused the problems. But I'm sure it's just missing a spring. So I almost don't want to go inside this, actually, because uh, the warranty seal has not been pierced. But, yeah, I guess I need to to clean it up and stuff. Someone's going to ultimately want to go into this uh, at some point, so. So I've got the three screws out, just pull it up at the front and uh, clip it off at the back. So, push it away a little bit as you lift it. There we go. Disconnect the LED. It's looking a bit dirty in here, you've got lots of fluff and stuff, so. Let's get the keyboard out, there's just the two screws, one on each side. Just connect the keyboard over here. Just pull the shield off. And you can see how dirty it is, it's filthy. Really filthy. So much been spilt in here previously as well. Look. Look how crusty it is around there. Oh my god. That's disgusting. Yeah, so it definitely uh, needs a clean up inside. But I don't think there's anything wrong with the board at all. Um, I will have it out you know, and inspect underneath just to make sure I've not got any dry solder joints and stuff, but it looks okay to me. So the keyboard will need a good clean. Uh, you can see that's looking pretty uh, manky as well actually. Uh, but it's this F1 key. But this is the thing I was interested in, just getting these two keys off. We pull the F1 key, look there's no spring. So, uh, now the nice thing is, the springs from say an A500 and A600 uh, are interchangeable. You might have to either stretch them or compress them a little bit, maybe snip a bit off depending on whether it's too high or too short. Uh, but they will work fine on these, I've used them in the past, because I've got a, a drawer full of them. I just bought some off eBay, a job lot, and there's like 50 or something. So, um, I think all the other keys have got a spring. Yeah. But that'll be the main reason why things have not been loaded. You know, if you've got a problem with F1, it's going to cause all sorts of problems. Or it's pressing itself. Especially in games that use F1 to specify, uh, you know, to start the game or for control options, etc. Yeah, all the other springs are there. Yeah, so here's some of the spares I've got. Um, I suspect that that's probably going to do the job, actually. So, yeah, I mean, bear in mind, these are going to come back off again because I'm going to clean this up, but... We'll just try that one on there. You can see, works perfectly. So let's uh, pull this one off. I suspect what might have happened, they might have lost the spring from there and swapped the one from over there. That's probably what they've done, but yeah, there you go. 
repair complete. <laughs> There's nothing else wrong with it, it just needs cleaning up now. So we'll get the vacuum onto the keyboard and the uh, motherboard. So I've got most of the fluff and dust off the top there. We'll get the board out anyway because uh, I want to clean the board up I think. Um, we'll get rid of the rust off the uh, cart port there because there's a bit there. I just need to come off with a fiberglass pen or some or a wire brush or a piece of sandpaper. It's just a piece of metal so there's no reason we shouldn't do something like that. So this one's got an 8500 instead of a 6510. Is it the uh, HMOS version I think maybe on these? And both of the CIAs are 6526As on this. 8565R2 Vic, which is uh, no surprise. And our 8580R5 Sid. Yeah, so the board's not looking too bad. Yep, mobile ESD generator's coming to shot. It's trying to get the board. Go away. So most of the fluff and dust has been vacked out that, but you can see it's really dirty. Uh, now, strictly speaking, quickest way of doing this is just stick it in the sink. But uh, I quite enjoy actually just cleaning these up manually myself. Uh, just going around like this. It's quite rewarding seeing that level of dirt come off on a paper towel, actually. Uh, for these corners and stuff here, I'll just get a load of soap and water. Um, and just get the scrubbing brush there to get in and out the little gaps and nooks and crannies. So yeah, you know, what I'm doing here is more or less the same sort of thing you would do in the sink. There we go, that's not too bad on the inside now. Now we'll clean up the uh, underside as well. I'm going to use IPA actually. Uh, it just uh, makes light work of marks like that. Can you see it's a bit pink there? That should just come straight off. Yeah, that was done. Look. Just look at the difference on the rubber foot there. Compare that one to the one that I haven't done over that side. Look at that. <laughs> the contrast is unbelievable. So let's now shift focus to the motherboard. I'm just going to use cotton buds and IPA here just initially to go over the main surface area. If we focus on areas like this first because that, that down here is really dirty. There was uh, lots of dirt and fluff and stuff down here which is no surprise because it's next to the connectors and things in the car ports, easy to have dust and fluff to get in here. But this is all I'm going to do is just go over the whole thing uh, inch by inch or millimetre by millimetre and collect all this uh, horrible ooze up. It's amazing how bad this is. You can see I've only gone over with a few cotton buds here. Look how dirty those are. So the majority of the dirt is off there now. As you can see, the board is uh, not looking too bad at all. I'll clean up the connectors in a minute, but I think we'll focus on this next because I've not had a go around that yet. So we'll get support some IPA around there, get the toothbrush and uh, have a good scrub from different angles. You can see it's pretty dirty. I need to clean the connectors up. I need to clean this up as well. So I'll just lob a bit of uh, IPA over there uh, and try and uh, have a good scrub around that area. It's not the easiest thing to get to. It might be easier to take the thing off actually. That's not too bad. So we'll clean up that shield uh, next. I'm just going to just tuck that under there because what I don't want is bits of uh, iron um, or whatever it is, you know, metal going onto the uh, PCB there. So I'll just get a bit of uh, WD-40 onto uh, a towel. Uh, any red bits will still stand out. We can then just, uh, you know, get rid of those with the uh, wire brush. Yeah, there's still a little bit there in a few places, I think, but most of it has come off, as you can see. So we'll go over these with the eraser, uh, and then some IPA, and then an eraser. Yeah, it's going to crumble, this rubber. It's uh, gone funny, the rubber, actually. It's, like, dried out, but you can see that's making a big difference already, actually. There's no need to get, like, a fiberglass pen or any sandpaper or anything like that on there. Those are the sort of things you don't really want to do on there. It's uh, got gold plates in there, as far as I can see. 
but this is the least uh, abrasive thing you can do to these. Look how clean that is compared to it was. I mean, look at this one, this one's filthy. So we'll just clean those with a bit of IPA, but before we do that, can you see there's some rubber got in between there? So yeah, use a toothbrush just to clear out the channels there. There's some rubber in between that one as well. Uh, I can just wipe those down with IPA on both sides now. Yeah, they've come out pretty good. Yeah, that's not bad at all. There's a little bit of corrosion just up there. Yeah, there's still a little bit of corrosion there, so I think I'm just going to go over that a little bit with the fiberglass pen just there. There we go, it's come off. Just on those little bits because the eraser was not getting it off, actually. Yeah, hopefully you can see the difference there. That's, that's solved it, actually. Just in those two places. Yeah, it's not the sort of thing you'd want to do all the way along this because it will remove the gold plating. But they're pretty good now. So I'm not going to put this piece of shielding back in. Uh, I'll keep this because I've not got a uh, piece of shielding in any of my systems actually. But uh, generally it's a good advice, you know, if you're going to be using one of these all the time, don't have that shielding on there. Just because it's covering over the chips, it's stopping, uh, not really circulation, but it's it may, keeping the heat trapped within. Uh, so, you know, if you want these to last longer, you know, heat sinks, oh, a bit chip creep there. Uh, heat sinks are a good idea. Um, I'll perhaps heat sink uh, these to the Vic and the uh, setup before this goes out. Uh, strictly speaking I should do a recap but uh, it's you know there's, there's nothing wrong with the caps on here I'm sure. So I sprayed some contact cleaner into the din there and into the switch. Uh, you tend to just be able to spray the switch here, get your nozzle in there and then just switch it off and on uh, a number of times and it works its way in there pretty, pretty okay actually. Uh, if you tilt it up on its side obviously it'll work even better uh, when you're trying to get the uh, contact cleaner in there. Well, that should be okay. We'll check the voltage now. Well, let's just power that up. Yeah, 4.97 volts. That's not bad. So I've washed all the keys. You can see how yellow they are, actually. Now, I mean, look at that. That's crazy. Uh, I'm not going to de-yellow these because this, I'm not going to keep this, and I don't really like uh, de-yellowing every single one of these I come across. It's so time-consuming. Uh, and I guess ultimately it's up to whoever wants to own this, whether they want to de-yellow it or not. Some people actually don't like you uh, de-yellowing them um, because, well, sometimes apparently they go yellow again. Uh, now, I haven't had any experience of that at all. There's lots of people suggesting that when you retrobite, say, a 1200, uh, over a period of a few years it'll go yellow again. Mine's perfect and it's in sunlight, not direct sunlight, but the sunlight gets on the table there. And it looks just as good as the day I did it, uh, which was about four years ago now, maybe five years ago, it was ages ago. So the keys have now dried, I'll get them all back on there. And I cleaned the actual surface of the keyboard there as well. And there you go, despite being yellowed, uh, it doesn't look bad actually. So I've checked the caps on this, the caps are good, uh, I'm not going to recap it. It's not absolutely essential. Uh, maybe if it was a bread bin, some of the older bread bins, the caps are pretty bad on them. So I'll connect up the keyboard. So we tested everything there, but I wanted to point out those diodes again, because I didn't actually focus on the on them on the board or anything like that. Um, there's a, a clump of diodes just near the uh, dins at the back there, if you look where the serial connector goes. You can see, I think there's like eight, six or eight diodes there. And you can see them here, and they are clamping. So one diode goes between ground and the signal, and then the signal, the other side of it, goes into the uh, anode of the diode, and its cathode goes to plus 5. So those clamp the signal between uh, ground and uh, 5 volts. Just to make sure that, you know, if you were to, as I say, plug a power into the serial port, uh, and I think the serial port connection's here, yeah, it's just the serial bus, um, but you don't, uh, you know, feed voltage into this, directly into wherever that goes. Uh, I think it may go to the CIA, yeah, it does. The tracer comes down here and goes into the CIA. So, yeah, those can be a common source of failure, those diodes. Make sure, you know, just put your meter on continuity test and measure across. If you find a short somewhere there, it's uh, worth taking the diode out and uh, checking it off the board. Um, but in this case, yeah, there was no issue. So, just finishing off here, uh, you can see these marks and things on the case. With a little bit of plastex, they come off actually. With IPA and soap and water, they just wouldn't come off. No matter how uh, much pressure you put on and stuff, they just were not coming off. With a bit of plastics, every little mark is coming off. Actually, I'm amazed. 
You'll be surprised at how good the uh, front end looks. So just quickly going back in there now to stick some heat sinks on. I'm going to leave the 8580 in there. I'm not going to swap it for the uh, Swinsard. Uh, I'm sure somebody will be grateful to get an actual genuine 8580. There's only so much hoarding one can do. And we'll get heat sinks on the uh, CPU and the VIC while we're here as well. Some chip creep there still, and well, that's chip. So heat sinks on the main three chips there. Reassemble it, I'll show you the final result. So something else to point out, this is a different board. This is the one I actually uh, fixed back in 2018. You can see the FPGA SID on there. Uh, there'll be an update video, as I mentioned earlier, coming for that soon. There's those diodes that I uh, talked about earlier. And someone's bound to ask, can you swap the CPU here? And yes, you can. This is the HMOS version, I think, the 8500. But you could fit a 6510 there, or fit that, you know, backfit that onto one of the older breadbin boards. Your PLA is obviously completely different. This integrates uh, some of the 7.4 series stuff that would normally be on a bread bin. You know, it's merged in with that, so you can't easily swap uh, the PLAs and things around. And the VIC chip on the 64C is an 8565R2, I think. Again, it's going to be uh, there's going to be PAL NTSC differences. So, you know, the code number is going to be subtly different on a US model versus this one I've got here. Uh, now you can swap those over, but you've got to be careful. And why, when I say you've got to be careful, if you were to fit this one onto a bread bin board, the older VIC chip, the 6569, etc., accepts 12 volts, I think, instead of five volts. This was changed, again, it's a HMOS part, I think. Um, it only uses five volts on its uh, VDD pin. So you've got, you know, that's where you'd need to be super careful. You'd have to modify the bread bin board so that you don't have 12 volts coming into that pin. You know, you'd have to cut a trace or something on the board to make sure that 12 volts doesn't go into wherever the VDD pin is. I'll perhaps stick it up there so you know which pin number it is. Um, and feed 5 volts from somewhere else on the board and you could use that. Um, of course, the opposite is true if you were to fit the older bread bin VIC chip in here. You'd need to, uh, you know, disconnect the 5 volt pin and find 5, 12 volts. Uh, I'm not sure there is 12 volts on this board. I think you've got 9, haven't you? I think you've got 9 on this board, but there isn't 12. You could fit a 7812 regulator uh, and do some, well, do something like that. Fit a 12 volt regulator or something somewhere. Because you've got a high, you know, a higher level than 12 volts coming in from the power supply. These use the same power supplies, obviously. So yeah, you can swap these. Just be mindful. You wouldn't want to just plug it in. You have to do some work on either instance there to alter the voltage coming into the VDD pin. And there we go, as you can see, uh, she's looking beautiful. There's uh, barely a mark left on it, actually. It's come up super, super, super clean. So yeah, I mean, it would have been nice. Uh, if I'd kept it myself, I'd be retro Brian keyboard. I'll leave that up to somebody else. I think it looks pretty good, actually. I don't think many people are going to be bothered about wanting to retro bright that. Anybody who's looking to get one of these for their collection, uh, it's in super pristine condition, this one now. It's got the original uh, 
protection thing on here, the film. So someone could peel that off. It's not rippled or anything, so you can't even tell, but it's definitely there. Um, I think most people perhaps wouldn't even want to bother retro brian that actually. It doesn't look too bad. Hopefully you found that interesting. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you soon.